You're watching Cherry Red TV. Uh, my name's Mark Powell. I'm label manager of uh, Esoteric Antenna, a Cherry Red label. And uh, on May the 28th, Esoteric Antenna released the album A Life Within a Day by Squackit, which is the collaborative project between um, Chris Squire and Steve Hackett. And I'm pleased to say that with me today is Steve Hackett. Thank you for uh, popping into Cherry Red TV, Steve. It's nice of you to uh, come along. Nice to see you too. And um, can I suppose I ought to really start by just saying, how did the Squacket project actually um, happen? What, what were the circumstances that led to that? Well, I met Chris in, in, the, uh, in the mid 80s when I was working on GTR. Um, he came to one of the shows. Um, Steve Howe and myself had uh, a, a GTR in, in the mid 80s. He came to our LA show, liked the two guitar combination idea. Um, and then we didn't speak for quite some time. Um, I told Chris how much I enjoyed uh, the various Yes incarnations over the years, and uh, you know everything from the Yes album to 90125 and uh, and and beyond. And um, uh, he got in touch. I think it was either 2006, 2007. I get the years mixed up. I must say, uh, he was making. Um, a Christmas album. He wanted to do something with the choir, and uh, he was hoping that um, someone might do guitar on it um, and get it done in about two weeks. So I said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll do that." And we worked flat out to get um, guitar and everything. And, and um, of course, you know, he'd reharmonized all of the uh, Christmas carols that were on it, so they weren't straight chords. You know, there were sixths and ninths and uh, and I, I thought I'll try and make it sound a little bit like the bells of Christmas via the Jim McGuinn sound on a on a um, uh, not a Stratocaster Rickenbacker. Yeah, that's the chap <laughs> Rickenbacker. I had a six-string Rickenbacker, and I doubled the octaves so it would sound nice and jangly and uh, and all that. So he seemed to really like the work, and we, and he was living in Chelsea at that time. Uh, we started to spend quite a lot of time together uh, with our families and um, uh, I said, well, would you like to return the favour? And he appeared on a couple of albums of mine. Uh, there were some legal complications um, with pretty much anything I was doing at that time and I wasn't able to um, release stuff as much as stockpile it. So one of the things that was stockpiled was the thing that is now called the Squacket project and um, he and I um, basically we, we wrote a lot of the stuff face to face uh, but some things came as, as prefab slices. Because it, as an album it's one of those things listeners out there would probably wonder what a collaborative project between the two of you would sound like and it's, I, I think it's an absolutely wonderful record but it's actually taken me by surprise because you're going into areas that you wouldn't necessarily expect, especially vocally. I think yeah. that your voices, the, the two of you, your voices blend really well together. The fact the emphasis on harmonies is, is there and it's a very vocal record as much as an instrumental record. Um, it probably is. Uh, I think um, he and I both enjoy songs. Uh, obviously we like vocal harmonies. Um, that's been a stock in trade of, of yes, and quite a lot of my stuff post Genesis. Um, uh, also, I think Chris was trained as a as a as a choir boy when he was very young, so that seems to, to creep in the whole time. The sort of choral approach, and um, and we both love orchestras. We both work with orchestras, with our respective projects and bands. Um, so I I think that colours it, and and and. Um, People that are expecting a, a, a kind of prog workout in, you know, uncountable time signatures and find the clue this and that. It, it's not impenetrable stuff. It, it's, it's very accessible. Uh, it's toe tapping in the main or head banging. <laughs> and uh, it's, um, I, th I suppose in a sense it's, um, you know, the idea, we were talking about various bands that we liked when we were growing up. Obviously, the Beatles. He'd met Hendrix, for instance, and, and uh, vaguely knew, knew him. Um, uh, the influence of The Who. And, you know, there's, 
there's so much of that 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 um, um, it, it's interesting going through his record collection, and um, he's a big fan of the Beach Boys, of course, and um, he liked Trick of the Tail, Genesis album, bass pedals, of course. Um, he said to me, um, I was one of the few guitarists, if not the only one he'd ever worked with, who actually liked working with orchestras. And I, I said, well, you know, they're all string players under the sun, you know, if it's guitar, if it's violin, cello, viola. So there is some orchestral stuff on the album. There's some real string players, on, uh, particularly uh, the first track, mm. Life Within a Day, the title track. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm anxious to see what, what people make of it, really, because the uh, reaction has been very, very strong. But I realise that we're not giving them exactly what they expect. As I say, it's not something that's cr so crowded with detail. Um, and it's not great long odysseys. You know, they're sort of manageable length, I think, the, uh, the tracks, bits of atmosphere in between. Uh, we'll see. You know, it's, mm. it's unborn thus far, yes. isn't it? Yes. But uh, no, it's, it's very interesting that I, th I think at this stage of your career in, in particular, I think you're possibly the mo most prolific you've actually been, I think, since you've, you've taken the step as a solo artist. Yeah, I think so. I'm probably the most proactive um, that I've been. Um, been a lot of projects recently, a, a lot of touring and a lot of working with, um, with other people who um, seem to be doing very well in their own in their own right, uh, friends like Stephen Wilson, who seems to be very much, you know, with his finger on the pulse, working with lots of people. Um, in recent times, I've worked with Gary Husband on an album that had John McLaughlin. So, you know, there was the accessible stuff and the more, to quote your record label, the more esoteric mm. stuff, perhaps. But um, that doesn't have to be a pejorative term at all, no. I think. Um, just to do things that aren't formula and, and allow yourself to get involved with unlikely constructions um, seems to me uh, what it's all about. I'm, I'm a bit of a detail freak as well. I think um, I, I will work endlessly on something to make sure that, that it's that it's dead right. You know, I, I just can't get away from that. And that's partly also working with Roger King, who's co-written um, many of these these tracks. Um, you know, he will work endlessly on, on detail, re refining it. So if he's not playing keyboards, he's engineering or producing, as he's done with this, um, with this uh, album. So there are moments that are influenced by film music, which he's been involved in, and I've been involved with a little in the past. Um, but how do you describe something when you haven't heard it? Mm. You know, it's just... I think, I think many people will be pleasantly surprised when they hear it. Uh, yeah, I hope I, so. I, I certainly was the first time I heard it. and. Uh, I, I, as I say, I think it's a marvellous thing. And it follows on very nicely from the, the last couple of solo albums that you've released as well, which have been very acclaimed as well. And, and uh, your, why, why do you think your profile is, has sort of risen so much over the last couple of years? Um, well, I think uh, since I remarried uh, to, to Jo, my wife, um, we've taken the attitude that, you know, that, that the business isn't constructed in the way that it was at one time where you could look down from a sort of vaunted position. Um, we've made lots of friends. Uh, uh, for instance, when I do shows, uh, usually afterwards I'll, I go out and, and uh, meet whoever's still there who wants a photograph signed or an album or whatever. and um, so. Um, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm meeting whole families who will tell me that they've been listening to everything over the past 40 years or so, and um, I, it's, it's amazing to think, isn't it? You know, when you, when you look at early interviews of, of the Beatles and George Harrison, you know, two or three years in, they say, well, what do you think you'll be doing in a couple of years? And he's saying, oh, I'll be opening up, you know, a string of hairdressing salons or something. And, um, you know, in, in those early days, who would have thought Sounds like a Python sketch, doesn't it? Who'd have thought we'd all be sitting here drinking shots? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, uh, I had no idea that that stuff was going to survive mm. that long, you know, the, the Genesis stuff. And, you know, bands like, like Yes, obviously, have been around 
for a long time now, even, even, even longer than Genesis, and that's saying something, you know, so we're talking about the 60s here. Mm. We're talking about halfway through the last century, never mind the decade we're in now, the second decade of this century. Well, if I, I can take you all the way back to that sort of era, yeah. um, what, what were your first inspirations uh, when, as, as a guitar player? What were your first sort of influences? What made you want to play the guitar? Uh, well, I, I played harmonica before that, um, 10 years or so before guitar, I, I was a harmonica player with a chromatic and trying to sound like Terry Riley and um, because my dad did um, and, um, and then he brought back a guitar from Canada when, when, and when I was about 12 years old I was finally big enough to play on one or two strings on I think it was a big old thing and um, I was listening to The Shadows at that time the first record I ever bought was Man of Mystery by, by The Shadows and that very twangy kind of cowboy sound that was all the rage at the time. Mm. Um, everyone sounding a little bit like the Bonanza soundtrack. Um, and then guitar started to change. It seemed by the time um, the Stones were on the scene, suddenly guitars were starting to scream and that was endlessly fascinating to me as was the sound of the harmonica in, the, in, in their hands, you know, Brian Jones, Mick Jagger. And, um, you know, before they became huge global gods, um, I was trying to work out every, every lick and um, even copying the mistakes. <laughs> See if I can fluff that note. God bless them, you know, and um, the same with, with, with Beatles stuff. So. That was it, and then the, 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 the big um, revelation for me was hearing Segovia plays Bach, and I, I suddenly realized I knew nothing about what, what the guitar was really capable of doing. Um, and all of these things became an influence, and mm -hmm. over time I had a go at Bach myself, and I did an album called Tribute with six Bach pieces on, and. Um, uh, but then I, you know, I, I, I think sonically all the developments in guitar happened in the blues, rhythm and blues, and all the guitar heroes, the early 60s versions, um, it was as if the guitar seemed to take on a life of its own, and uh, people that could really control it, and I'm thinking of Eric Clapton, and Jeff Beck, Peter Green, Hendrix, um, all on our shores, plugging away at the same time, so, um, you know, there was wonderful stuff going on. And guitar is still developing, of course. You know, by the time the, what we now call the progressive era, although mm. we didn't think it was progressive at the time, um, it seems as if those two strands of, of music, the, the more instinctive and the more intellectual perhaps, came together almost like well, art and science, I mm. guess, all coming together, the left and right sides of, of the brain. And so, um, uh, art rock or prog or whatever you want to call it was born, whether that's fusion or collision, whatever you call it now. Um, and it, seem, it seems as if all the genres were included in that. So the pan genre approach allowed jazz, it allowed classical music, it allowed commercial pop, it allowed rock, it allowed blues. You could do anything and now under the, the banner of world music, of course, Everything is relevant. Nothing is, nothing is considered to be regional music, and um, and it's a great thing that the barriers have come down, and um, and it's given an international career to people who can really, uh, can really play or really sing or or, or really write, and and um, and that's right because you know, uh, American and and, and uh, UK domination had to change. Um, we couldn't keep it all to ourselves, so it's lovely that, that you know, um, I'll work with people from Hungary, from Azerbaijan, from Morocco, um, we'll travel to, the, to those places and sometimes engage with those people. Other times it'll be the great melting pot, which is Eastern Europe, um, uh, so you have, you know, the world of jazz and uh, all that entails, but also via Hungary. Um, Gypsy music and gypsy in, improvisation, which is cha which is different again, 
uh, yes, it, it's very untutored. Um, it might all be on a drone, so it's closer to, to folk music, but you get all those inflections that are so uncopyable. Um, there's just so much out there, and, and I, I want to get it on every single record that I, that I make, if I possibly can. It's quite a task, but I'm sure yeah. you know, you've, you've covered well, quite a few bases. And I, I would say that um, when you, you first came to prominence, obviously, with, with, with Genesis, and your guitar style with Genesis was pretty unique at the time. Um, did you find that, uh, what, what was your experience prior to joining Genesis in terms of playing with bands that, that actually led you to develop that, that, that guitar style that, you, that became synonymous with those early Genesis albums? Um, well, I made an album with a band called Quiet World. We didn't do any gigs, but um, I got to work with the producer, John Schroeder, of um, Cast Your Fate to the Wind fame. And um, I believe that was his composition. And um, um, he seemed to pick up on my affinity with blues and he had me doing one or two blues sessions for him. He'd worked previously with Jimmy Page and he said, he said, the nice thing about working with Jimmy Page is that even if he was working on, you know, something which he might think was formula pop, he always gave it his all. So I think he worked on all sorts of things, everything from Emil Ford to Tom Jones, probably to Frank Ifield, if, if the truth be known, because I know John Schroeder was involved with that. And um, he saw a little bit of something similar in me, because he, he got the feeling that when I went to it, I, I gave it my all. You know, I've always thought that. I've always cared passionately about every note. I can't stand it if it's not right, you know. Um, obviously, in, in in a band context, you know, you have to take the rough with the smooth. You can't control it all, you know. I mean, Genesis was full of, of um, you know, brilliant guys. And at times, that was quite um, daunting, the prospect of bringing a song to a band who had been working together in some shape or form since they were 11 years old. That's where, you know, they were at school, they were developing uh, in that way. But um, so it was, it, in a way, I got the feeling that I was plugging into a, a certain school. Um, I felt I could give it something, but I had no idea how difficult that was going to be because I, I hadn't really done any, any, any shows. I mean, I'd done a handful of gigs and the odd cricket ground, the odd you know, um, thing on the Thames, pleasure boat up the Thames when, you know, if everyone's drunk enough, they might quite enjoy it, but <laughs> otherwise they, they don't give a toss. Um, so I, I came from a very different background, um, but we shared this affinity with, um, you know, jazz and folk and, and all sorts of things. Genesis was very, um, very eclectic in their tastes. It wasn't as if they were all into punk or something. Um, it seemed as if um, pretty much every kind of style of music was covered with the various tastes that Mike Rutherford enjoyed, um, Joni Mitchell and Judy Collins. Uh, he liked their guitar style. Um, I shared a love of 12 string stuff and I just, I'd either just sold a 12 string because I was hard up or I just bought one. Um, and um, I think it was 12-string work that got me the gig mm. with Genesis because um, Mike and Anthony Phillips, uh, before me of course, and Tony Banks, um, there was this idea of playing lots of 12-strings all together and, and the effect of that by the time you shoved them through Leslie cabinets and pickups and mics, you couldn't really tell whether you were listening to guitar or keyboard, so I think that was one of Genesis' strengths was, you know, what is it? What, are, what am I hearing? And um, so in, in a way, before the term fusion was born, I think that's, you know, very much what Genesis was all about. It was a fusion of, of, of instruments. Because certainly I think with, with your arrival within Genesis, if you listen to, to, to Nursery Crime, for example, that the, the band's music 
stepped up a gear, it seemed, with, with your arrival uh, in the band, and also, as I suppose, with Phil's arrival just, just yeah. prior to that. Um, I'm thinking in particular of things like your guitar work on, on say, Musical Box, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were using a, a tapping style that various people yeah. hadn't actually used at that point. Was yeah. that something you d developed? How did you come to, to develop that style? Well, we were playing lots of live gigs and I was trying to play a phrase from, once again, probably something from Bach, um, Toccata and Fugue, and it may have been just one of those phrases and I realised you couldn't really do it comfortably on the six strings of a guitar, but you could make the leap if you played all on one string. Um, so I realised that not, not only could you hammer on and off with the left hand, but with the right hand you could do something similar as well. Uh, and when I first tried it, I couldn't play it in time at all. Uh, the coordination necessary for that um, was kind of broken in over a series of gigs and then we got to record the album, um, I think in the late summer. Uh, we'd taken three months off to work together and um, uh, but that was that uh, it was a pioneering technique, um, which has become part of um, the, the mainstay, of part of the glossary of terms of the shredders and heavy metal people. You know that um, for a short while there, I'd be the fastest guitarist on the planet because there's always someone faster <laughs> tomorrow. But you know, for, it's it's um, you know people were trying to play some of my guitar parts, thinking. God, how does he do that mm. over the, you know, over several strings? And of course, it's impossible. And then there was sweep picking as well, which was something else again, you know, from the world of classical music, and the idea of uh, a violinist using a bow and rocking the bow over um, a fixed position so that they're arpeggiating uh, like this. And I, I was doing something similar with um, with that. So you're moving forwards, but backwards over over a fixed position so it's and it's it's almost kind of harp like so it's it, i think it's this thing about trying to impersonate other instruments that's when the guitar gets really interesting is when it sounds a bit like a voice or a bit like a trumpet you know a bit like a sax um and i'm always trying to um make it still you know guitars sound like uh saxes or, mm. or, or, or or keyboards. You worked consistently hard when you, you were with Genesis. Did, did the eventual success, when it came, um, I suppose around the time of things like from Foxtrot on then on, on to Selling England by the Pound, did that, yeah. was that something you, you, you saw that, that Genesis, when you joined the band, you saw that there, there could be that chance to be? You, you, you had, did you think the band could actually grow to that, to that sort of stature when you, when you joined them? Not when I first joined. Um, it seemed as, as though for the first couple of albums that you know, we were barely making a living, really. Um, and, you know, you never knew if the game was going to be up the following day. So um, I, it's not false modesty. It's for real. I always wanted to be better than, than, I, than I was. I, I, never, I never thought I, I arrived. You know, I, and I don't think I ever will because even if there's huge response to any one particular project, you know, there's always the feeling that, oh, the next album will be the one where I really get to <laughs> put myself through the ringer, you know. It's always jumping through other people's... Jump you see, if, you'd, if I'd been a classical player and I'd learnt to jump through other people's hoops, and that would have been one thing, but then I always wanted to improve as a player. It's a funny thing, isn't it? When you're a kid, you think, um, uh, me, you know, about age 16 or so, and I, I'd be looking in, in the shops at Shaftesbury Avenue, and I'd look at all the guitar shops and amps, and I think, anyone who's got one of those and one of those has made it, you know. Anyone who's got a Les Paul and a Marshall stack has made it. They've made it already. But then by the time you've acquired said equipment, um, you think, well, it'd be nice to play in a band, wouldn't it, with this, <laughs> with this stuff? And then, um, and then by the time you've done that, it's, it's always, yes, 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 you know, uh, yes, wouldn't it be nice to have done that? Wouldn't it be nice if, 
if the band, you know, has an audience and um, it's 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 a funny thing. I don't think that the hunger is ever really satisfied. You know, it's not it's not till you've written a hit tune, and then even when you've written a hit tune, it goes on. You know, you talk to people like Pete Townsend about this sort of stuff, and he'll tell you. I say, so, you know, keep your profile up. You know, it's that sort of thing. So that I guess that's what's going on because I've just been involved with a phenomenal amount of of projects recently, and. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm busier than ever, and um, I'll probably get busier in the future too. What um, led to you to start thinking about a possible solo career uh, when you were in, in Genesis? Because you'd, at, at the point you, you left the band, mm. the band was sort of growing in, in stature continually yeah. with each successive album. Well, it, com it comes down to one thing. Um, normally, I, all my answers are far too long to all, all questions, but it comes down to one small word, which is autonomy. I can elaborate further mm -hmm. if you want. Please, <laughs> no. no, please do. Okay. <laughs> well, um, if you're in a band, you need everyone's permission to do anything. Plug in an electric guitar, pick up acoustic, write a song. You know, it's it's the group. It's that you need everyone's cooperation, and at times, you know, people can be very competitive in in in, in, in a group, and um, you don't always get total cooperation. Um, uh, but still, if you know that you've got a great idea, what are you going to do with that great idea? Because you just know it. You, know, you speak to people like, you know, Sting will say, you know, I just knew I'd written a hit with. Uh, the big one they had, you know, and that's how musicians are. They just know when they've hit something that's going to move people because, you know, if it genuinely moves you, that, that's the only yardstick you've got. So it's not, it's not egotism, it's just, it's a kid with a bright, shiny new toy. You just know that it has to have pride of place. So um, the album I did once I left the band, having done a solo thing beforehand and, and gotten the bug, of course, you see, that's the... I was, the I was actually going to mention that, of course, because mm. you were the first member of the band to actually do a solo album. I was. I was. Uh, whilst you were still in, in Genesis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, that, that was great fun. How did that sort of react? Because Voyage of the Acolyte was obviously mm. was successful as well. Yes. And how did that sit with everybody else in, in the band? Uh, did, did you feel that was when you first started getting itchy feet yeah. after that. Yeah, well I wanted to work with my brother who was a phenomenal flute player already before he'd recorded a professional note. And um, it was wonderful, you know. Um, Phil and Mike were great. They came in and played drums and guitar and bass. And um, um, so that was, that was amazing. So I was making this album on I was chain smoking and, and existing on cups of soup from this dispenser in the, in the studio. And um, I, I just loved the whole experience. I, I did it practically without sleep, you know, in th three weeks of just flat out, no sleep, no food. Pure joy. And um, uh, the album took off. Uh, made it kind of difficult within the group um, because, hello, you know, someone's already, you know, developing a career of their own and um, I think when Peter Gabriel was the lead singer of, of Genesis, his performance with the band live tended to be reviewed separately, I mean, rather like David Bowie and the band, mm. you know, but we had a group name. Uh, and then attention started to come my way and, um, you know, some members of the band felt that, that you know, they'd broken the monopoly that was um, perhaps rightfully Peter's, you know, in, in the early days because he was putting everything in, in, into the live mm. show. Sure, we, sh we, we shared the writing, there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, but, you know, would that 
bands were set up in, in, in the following way. The ideal band is a complete democracy and, and, and no egos other than just serving the best interests of each other's music. In practice, it doesn't quite work like that. So um, uh, it, it was difficult to um, uh, turn off the tap that had been switched on. You know, it, if my writing had been a, a dribble before that, um, um, let, let, let me, I, I suppose I'm, I'm trying to justify this in a, in a, in a way. It's the difference between a waterfall, you know, once you start requiring that from yourself, uh, you, you, you can't switch it off, it, it becomes a flood, there's no doubt about it. But, um, you know, I'd, I'd be happy with, you know, riffs in songs and, and, and sometimes whole songs with, with Genesis because I, I did give it everything that I was a, allowed to do. Um, I wanted to make sure that the band had a Mellotron, I wanted to make sure that the band had a light show, a synthesizer. I wanted to bring out the best in everybody. Um, I wanted to be the glue and I wanted to be an in-house critic. I wanted to be positive about it. But sometimes, you know, you end up saying unpopular things, don't you? you? Just you have to be honest to work together to get the best out of everyone. You're not all going to see it the same way. Mm. But um, um, so I'm giving you the very long answer. Really, it's about autonomy. And um, if you care, then you'll need to have autonomy at some point. Uh, would that I could have had a parallel career to the band, but that wasn't on offer. Uh, the band didn't want me to continue to make solo albums. Um, and um, I felt that ultimately my allegiance was to music rather than to the greatest band in the world. Ultimately, as I say, the allegiance is to, is to music itself. So when you finally made that, that leap, um, yeah. Did you find that suddenly, did, did you sit back for a minute and think, what have I done here? Or were you, did, were you just absolutely focused on what you, what you were going to do with, which, with what became Please Don't Touch, your, your second album? Was, um, that, was that all that was, that was what was driving you really at that point? Yeah, um, I was very focused on that. Um, I had various singers because I hadn't evolved to the, to the point where I thought I could be the lead singer. Um, I go in and out of that, you know. I am one of the singers that I work with. I work with other singers. Um, when I work with Chris, of course, you know, with Squack It, we are the lead singers of the band. Sometimes he takes it, sometimes I take it. Um, you know, it's like Jack Bruce and Eric Clapton, isn't it? You know, with, with Cream, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. I, I think I don't really have an ego. Maybe I'm kidding myself here, but um, um, I'm quite prepared to sit back and play rhythm guitar if I thought that that's served the best interests of any particular song. I'd be quite happy to do that and, um, and be more involved with making a few production suggestions. Because with your second album, you gather together a, a pretty impressive cast of fine yeah. people. Um, I'm thinking in particular Richie Havens and, yep. and also Randy Crawford yep. uh, sang on the album. Yes. How did they actually get involved with that project? Um, Richie Havens, uh, Genesis were great fans of Richie Havens. Uh, we used to listen to him on the way to gigs sometimes. Um, then when we were doing the, the Earl's Court show in 77, uh, shows, I should say. Um, we asked if he would be a support act for us. And he said yes, and I, I met him backstage. Uh, the response to him wasn't particularly strong from the crowd, and I apologised to him backstage, I said. Um, in no way did the response of the crowd parallel the quality of your performance. And uh, so I'm sorry about that, but you know, shook my hand warmly 
And uh, I, at some point I said to him, because I was talking to Dave LeBolt, his keyboard player, who seemed to be uh, interested in all the stuff I was doing. Um, I invited them over to dinner. He came to dinner. It was, it was just great. And I thought, I mustn't be pushy about this. So at the end of, end of the evening, he said to me, we should, we should do something together. I thought, yep, like nothing better. And, and three months later, I think I, I would, was phoning him up and saying, I've got a song, you know, I think, you know, might, maybe two, might, might, might be nice. And he said, I can hear it already. It sounds great. <laughs> he was so positive. He was just totally wonderful to work with. You couldn't come across a more wonderful guy to work with. Just totally positive uh, with that incredible voice. Mm. And I was thrilled that Peter Gabriel used him on the OVO project um, years later. Um, so in a way, he'd had the san sanction of two people ex-Genesis, of course, in that, <laughs> in that case, but the fact that, yeah, you know, he is a singer's singer, and uh, I think Gabriel, when he spoke to him, said, um, for the Ovo project, um, I've got this song, I was thinking of singing it myself, but I think you might just sound better on it, and uh, it's a standout track on it, sounds fantastic. Funnily enough, I think one of the other singers on that, um, Elizabeth Fraser, I've been working with her oh, really? recently. Yeah, I've worked on, on an album of hers, which has taken yonks to come out. I, I hope that she'll be, um, that she'll finish this thing. This thing. She, I think she's got to take part in the meltdown thing on the South Bank and I might do a walk on with her. It's beautiful material and her voice is, is, is extraordinary as well. So it's funny how people orientate towards mm. each other, isn't it? Um, she liked the stuff I'd done on The, the Lamb. She married um, um, to Damon Reese, um, ex of Echo and the Bunny Men and Spiritualized and Massive Attack. They both work with Massive Attack. And um, very lovely couple. So it goes on, doesn't mm. it? You know, this, this, uh, the candle gets handed on and to others. Was it, a, it must have been a satisfying moment when you, your first post sort of Genesis solo album did, did well. Um, yes, uh, I think. The, the first one did better because it had the Genesis mm. guys on, but over time, um, um, Stephen Wilson has praised it, and I know he's mad keen on doing a 5.1 of it. So I'm hoping that 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 will happen at some point. Um, uh, Randy Crawford, of course, was involved with that, having seen us sing in a, in a Chicago nightclub, thinking that girl, you know, who had nothing released in this country at that point. So was that prior to her international mm. success? Yeah, oh, yeah, way, way before, yeah. Um, so I'm, again, it's nice because it validates my instinct. Um, I don't think of myself as anything like a talent scout. I mean, I don't go out there hunting for it. It just, it just happened. Um, then I kind of had my own band for touring around about the time of Spectral Mornings. Um, and that was a very interesting time. Again, we sort of took a combined vocal harmony approach again, which is what I'm going through again with, with, um, with Chris. Mm. Uh, yes, there was a, a lead singer with that, a Pete Hicks, but um, equally there was Dick Cadbury, who'd been trained as a countertenor and had been involved with Decameron. And um, uh, so he was kind of orchestrating the harmonies um, and we had a sound, you know, there's always been this thing about if, if there's a yardstick for three-part harmony, it's got to be somewhere between Crosby, Stills, Nash and the Beatles. And so that's always the thing, you know, that, uh, and, and some people say, of course, with the Squacket thing, um, ah, you know, the single, mm -hmm. um, Sea of Smiles sounds kind of Crosby, Stills, it, 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 it's, it's the three-part thing. It is. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that I think as a solo artist, your solo career really took off, flying right in the face of punk. It seemed to sort of, you know, yeah. where other artists were suffering yeah. through the through the new wave and the punk thing, you actually were flourishing, and had some well, of your most successful solo albums at that point. Um, I think I I was lucky at that time. Um, I was doing a lot of touring, 
which meant I was amassing a, a fan base. Um, but obviously everything I was doing was flying in the face of the Yabu sucks thing that was <laughs> that, that was punk. Um, and um, yeah, I couldn't really see me with a razor blade through the nose and, <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. One thing um, I'd like to ask you about as well is because you mentioned it at the very start of this conversation, but you mentioned uh, GTR. Yeah. And a, a previous collaborative project yeah. with another member of, Ye of Yes. Um, how did that GTR thing happen? And what, you, what are your views on, on the project now, looking, looking back on it after all these years? How do you view it? Well, I think um, I knew Brian Lane, um, who was a near neighbour of, of mine. I bump into him from time to time. Um, and David Putnam, the filmmaker, uh, ironically. And um, I think that Brian Lane kept tabs on me, you know, because he was busy managing everyone from Daley Thompson to George Best to you know, Catherine Jenkins of, of late. And um, uh, so I think that he always thought, yes, you know, Steve would be right for my stable of, of acts, which included, you know, Yes and Asia and, um, and many others and The Buggles and Trevor Horn, you know, all of, all of that. So um, I was very well aware of the way he thought, and um, um, I'd signed to, to Lamborghini Records, which gave me autonomy, but, you know, they pulled in and out of the uh, music business very, very mm. quickly, so over the course of two albums, suddenly, they were not just making cars, they were making luggage, perfume, everything, um, kitchen sink, and uh, they'd overextended. Uh, some of the Yes guys have been involved with that again you know because it seems as if my my trajectory and my path and the yes guys seem to have been paralleled I mean I'd worked with Pete Banks on an album of his way back um, so Patrick Moraz uh, Bill Bruford they'd done some stuff for, for Lamborghini um, but at, you know when that came to an end um, I was very well aware that um, I was starting to head towards the periphery with that and, um, you know, like the equivalent of, of fringe theatre. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt the need at that time in, in the 80s when music was extremely accountable in a more corporate age. Um, I felt the need to prove to people that Genesis and my success with it wasn't just a fluke. So I went at it a little bit like a science. Uh, and I think GTR, we wrote some very good things together. Um, there were some great moments in rehearsal. Unfortunately, that sort of free spirit that existed around Cream at that time didn't really work at that time and we were signed to Clive Davis and Arista and um, it seemed as if money was no object so uh, we, we were certainly spoiled for that um, but um, the irony was you know we had this hit album in America but but to support that level of success um, from the UK was was um, you know, very tax, taxing mm. for the bank manager. I won't talk about music any more than that because, it, you know, really this should all be, uh, uh, I shouldn't talk about money, but mm. about music uh, more perhaps. But, you know, those sorts of things come into it. And um, so it was, a very, it was a very interesting time, but um, um, again, I've been used to running my own ship and suddenly, you know, to be in a band project again, as I'll call GTR. Um, it seems as if you're going back to school a little bit because, you know, having not needed permission to do certain things 
for a while, um, it was quite difficult to have a separate producer and um, not to call all the shots. Um, but I think we made an interesting record. And you mentioned, so you went from when the GTR project mm. finished, you went mm. back to, to looking after your solo career. And you, you yeah. mentioned that you've always felt that you, you should handle everything. And now, I, more than ever, I would say you're, you're more fiercely independent than you've, you've ever been. Yeah. And at the same time, um, you, your, your collaborative projects, for example, you're working yeah. with so many different people, that, yes. as you mentioned earlier. Yes. Um, does the enthusiasm you have for music sort of remain, clearly remains un unabated? You're, you're still um, remarkably enthusiastic about music, where many artists with a long career, such as yours, you know, mm. sometimes they feel a little jaded or they don't actually... Yeah, yeah funny that, isn't it? Yes, I'm still mad about music. But uh, I suspect you are yourself, of course, mm -hmm. because <laughs> you've been Indeed, in the industry yes. for, for a while yourself. And, and uh, I, I think the thing is, um, with, with the various projects you're doing now, you're, you're mm. covering a wide stylistic base. Mm. I'm thinking you, yeah. you, you're working, for example, you, you worked with Stephen Wilson recently on yeah. his... Um, how did you get involved with, with Stephen on, on that, that project? Um, now, I think I first met Stephen... Um, when I was playing the High Voltage Festival. And I think that was the, the first time we'd actually uh, uh, met up. I, we'd been involved in things together at a distance. I'd worked with uh, Ben Castle on, on a, an album called um, Post Mankind. Um, uh, so, um, and, and he'd, he'd mixed that. I, I'm not even sure if he was credited with, with production on it, but um, uh, so that was that was great. So there was a, 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 a Marillion uh, tie up there with Ian, Ian Mosley. Mm. Ian, Ian was playing drums, and um, Ben, son of the late great Roy Castle, um, who himself is a multi -in instrumentalist. Um, that was very good, and I thought the album was really very well produced, very well mixed. Um, so I, I, I met Stephen, and um, he, he seemed to be um, very dedicated to music and uh, very um, um, very fast thinker. I, I sometimes think I'm a very slow thinker and a very slow talker. At times, you know, I, I have this thing I <laughs> I care about <laughs> about it so much. I sometimes can't get the words out mm. and. Um, but you know he's got that sort of producer's thing, and he's got almost like all the answers and bam, 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 the sort of verbal bazooka kind of uh, approach, and he's right on the money with with a certain thing and um, and ideas. And uh, but he's got a great sense of humour, and uh, you know we've hung out together, and we've broken bread, and and um, shared a lot of lot of good times together. Again, you know it's an extension of of friendship. So mm. when I worked with him. Um, he didn't really know what he wanted out, out of me, and I didn't really know what he wanted, so we did all these carefully constructed phrases, and then at the end of the day, I thought, oh, to hell with it. What I'll do is I'll use a digi-chip whammy pedal, and I'll turn the guitar up two octaves higher than usual and start playing chords with it. The most outlandish thing you could possibly do. And he said, yep, that's it. <laughs> you know, this one's got real sort of, it's like piccolo guitar and distorted at that. Um, and. Um, you know, previously he thought he was just collecting data and then he'll just serve it up, you know, like slinging enough mud at the wall. Um, valid approach. Now, I think it was the following day I was working with Gary Husband. Mm. And, you know, Gary had set phrases, he knew exactly what he wanted played, and I would suggest certain inflections with those phrases and, um, an album that had a number of guitarists on, including the great John McLaughlin. Um, so I was thrilled to be part of that, you know, thrilled to be part of that jazz world and learning about some of those jazz harmonies. Um, so, you know, he's a very interesting character because he's um, sometimes drums with level 42, keyboard with John 
McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. I mean, how how clever is that? That's that's marvellous. I think the diver sheer diversity of what you're up to these days is it makes following your career more fascinating than it's been for a long time. And, right. Uh, yeah. I think it's very gratifying to see you out there doing so many different things. What do you think? What, where do you see the future? Do you uh, do you? Are you just going to carry on the way you've been doing it recently? Do you see, see it? Or well, you, probably, you... yes. Um, luckily, the fingers, as of today, are working, you know, very well. Um, yes, i would probably just get, you know, busier and busier. Um, and I've got no thought of retirement. I just get more and more enthusiastic about, about music. And live performances, you're doing a, a, a large number of live performances, probably more than you've done with the band for many years. Yes, I am. Um, yep. Does that, do you, have you got a sudden sort of enthusiasm again for live performance? Do you, yes. Do you? Yes, I have. I, I, and um, in terms of the projects that I can take uh, live, um, because I'm working on a, on a, a reapproach to Genesis uh, material where not only am I recording some of the old, much-loved songs, but I'm linking them with new pieces of music, and uh, I'm going to take that on the road next year. Um, so, um, you know, it's a reinvention of, of what that band was meant to me, and I um, don't know what tense to use with this, you know. Is it solo? Is it a band? It's whatever the collection of, of individuals make of it at, 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 at that time. Uh, but on record, I'm, I'm um, using a number of different um, singers and, and players. I'm even you know, sharing it with different guitarists as well, because I want to have the overview rather than to be you know, the cog in the middle. Um, you know, so concerned with the machinery that I'm not seeing the, fi the, the whole, the whole. So uh, I want to step back from it to some extent, and uh, you know, be able to give it some gloss, polish mm. the uh, the vehicle when it's all uh, when it's all done. So um, um, I, you see, I, I, I very much like the style of the band during the 70s. Um, I think what the 80s gave it was. Was, was gloss, you know, after my departure and, and Peter. Um, things are obviously being recorded to click tracks and uh, precision is, is um, the order of the day. But um, production techniques change, compressed ambient mics on drums to make them explode like cannons. That's a feature of the 1980s ever since um, Peter Gabriel on his Mm. Third album, was it? Yes. Or, yeah, third album, you know, where suddenly uh, the drums start to um, take on the kind of prominence that previously we thought would only happen live. Um, uh, so it was almost as if John Bonham had gone ballistic. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As part of your live shows, you do play some Genesis tracks now. Is that something you've sort of recently yeah. sort of introduced? I'm thinking about things like Firth of Fifth and Blood yes. on the Rooftops and things like that. Was they've crept in more and more? You see, um, uh, I just used to do the guitar solo from Firth of Fifth, and then um, you realise that it's not just the completists, but people do actually like the whole song. And um, at one point I thought, you know, before I had a regular band, it's a tall order for professionals to come in and start doing that from the piano introduction onwards. You know, it, it's, it takes a lot of dedication to get to that point, to be able to do that difficult, but I should, maybe I should say intricate music rather than difficult music. It's a, again, it's a bit like Bach. Uh, rock probably doesn't get much more intricate than that, but um, again, you know, with, with Bach, it's not the intricacy, that, that's a given. It's 
the simplicity of the line that runs through it, you, that the idea that it's, it's actually going somewhere. Uh, I think that's what Genesis had in common with Baroque music, perhaps. But, but then you've got all the additional aspects of syncopated music, big band, syncopated, um, Buddy Rich, uh, perhaps even un unconsciously an influence of, of Bartok and, and the Eastern Europeans working with um, time signatures, uh, sort of abbreviated bars of folk music. Something again that's common to, to Hungarian music and they always seem to have had this ability to juggle with, with time signatures. So is the next Genesis Revisited project, that's your next uh, album? That's project, my next yeah. thing. But of course, as we sit here, you know, Squack It. We have Squack It, yes. We have Squack It, which is out in a matter of days. Um, and then I'm already involved in the, other, in the other project. So the idea is to keep it coming. And you continue to be able to juggle all the projects successfully as well. And, uh, Yes, I mean, well, sometimes, you know, when you're in the middle of it, you know what it's like, sometimes you're tearing your hair out trying to make ends meet. Uh, uh, but um, um, it only seems like smooth sailing when you come to the end of a project and people like it and they haven't had to go through the, the agony and hopefully they're just left with the ecstasy <laughs> of it. So, oh, in one go, how do you do that? That seems... Very clever, and um, I, I often think that the public perhaps think that, you know, you start recording an album and the first thing's done is the very first note that's played, but it, it's rather like shooting film, and of course, um, you might be filming the last sequence first of all, in fact, and um, um, so it doesn't happen in, in, in real time. Mm. Uh, jazz does, of course. Jazz happens in real time, and um, and uh, I'm full of admiration for the skills of the jazz man to be able to do that. But I work with with very gifted players who are capable of that, and sometimes, you know, it's a bit like wandering into the wrong room, isn't it? Oh my God, I'm here with you know, with the you know the Gary Husbands and the and the Rob Townsends, you know, who are you know immensely gifted people harmonically. Um, uh, who can do in five seconds, you know, what will take me a, a, a day to construct, perhaps. <laughs> That's, you know, Rob does a solo, like, it's a fantastic solo on something like Serpentine Song, and, and then yeah, he'll do, you know, four or five great solos, and if you want, you can edit between them, but they're all of a level of proficiency. Um, whereas I tend to be more considered, you know, I'm from the self-taught, end of, uh, of yes. things. So your creative muse is still with you. Yes, um, yes, yeah. Long may it continue. Thank well, you. Steve Hackett, thank you very much for taking time out to talk to us on True TV today. Thank, thank you. Thank you.